Hi, I'm Eldrick Stoneskin, and the video essay that you're about to watch is part three in a series containing my theory surrounding the secret of the Winterfell Crypts, and ultimately the key to defending humanity against the coming onslaught of the others. I believe that Azor High and the Last Hero were not only the same person, but they were also a Stark. And the magic this Stark hero gained from the Children of the Forest to help defeat the others was the ability to be sacrificed, turned to stone, and resurrected through the Weirwoods, creating a group of undead stone warriors that would come to be known as the Night's Watch. With their stone skin becoming a magical protective armour that warded the wearer from harm, while also preserving their bodies as statues after the War for the Dawn has been won to be stored behind the collapsed wall in the Winterfell crypts as the Stone Kings of Winter, waiting for the horn that wakes the sleepers. And I think George is foreshadowing that this is the case through his Azor Ahai Last Hero parallel characters in the series, giving them resurrected stone warrior symbolism, just like the Stone Kings of Winter in the crypts. And the first character I'd like to discuss that foreshadows Azor Ahai and the First Night's Watch as resurrected stone warriors beneath a weirwood is Beric Dondarrion. Lord Beric Dondarrion is a resurrected one-eyed knight who is seen with a burning sword, making him a very clear Azor Ahai parallel character and therefore informing us of who Azor Ahai was and will be. In fact, George has even said that Beric was set up to be foreshadowing for Jon Snow, our next Azor Ahai, who also has one-eyed symbolism, dreams of wielding a burning sword, and is set to be resurrected as well. And during Beric's fight with the Hound beneath High Heart, we see his sword snap in two, giving us not only the broken sword symbol of Azor High, but also the broken sword symbol of the last hero's story, and reminding us of the broken sword of the Kings of Winter as well. And just like the Kings of Winter and Bloodraven, this Azor Ahai character is seated on a symbolic throne of weirwood roots beneath a hollow hill. And by referring to him as almost lost in the weirwood roots, it implies him as symbolically being inside the tree itself, just like Bloodraven is, and I suggest the King of Winter Azor Ahai is as well. In fact, to further this, another name Lord Beric is known by is the Wisp of the Wood, with Wisp meaning ghost showing us an Azor Ahai character as a ghost within a tree. The Brotherhood Beric leads are also referred to as the Knights of the Hollow Hill, as they are found residing in a cave beneath a weirwood grove, showing us Azor Ahai as leading an army from beneath a weirwood. In fact, the other name this group goes by, the Brotherhood Without Banners, also tells us that these Knights of the Hollow Hill are meant to symbolically represent the Night's Watch as well who are also a brotherhood without banners as they give up their sigils and family names when they take the black, as our first night's watch beneath Winterfell did, becoming a brotherhood of stone corpses. And it just so happens that Beric is also known as the Lord of Corpses, potentially foreshadowing Azor Ahai leading an army of undead warriors yet again. But most interestingly, after Beric's sword catches fire, the first moment we see this character truly represent Azor Ahai, Arya describes Beric as standing so still he might have been carved of stone, giving us a very direct example of our Long Night Hero parallel character being made of stone, further suggesting that Azor Ahai was in fact turned to stone to protect and preserve himself and his companions. In fact, to further this, George gives us this amazing quote while Catelyn and the Blackfish discuss the Brotherhood in A Clash of Kings. It's said that Sir Burton Craighall was boasting that he'd slain Dondarrion until he led his column into one of Lord Beric's traps and got every man of them killed. Some of Ned's guard from King's Landing are with this Lord Beric, Catelyn recalled. May the gods preserve them. Dondarrion and this Red Priest who rides with him are clever enough to preserve themselves if the tales be true. Which is an interesting addition by George, as this directly references Azor Ahai and his Stark soldiers as being preserved by the gods, just as we're suggesting happened to the hero of the last long night and his companions being preserved as statues 
for thousands of years by the old gods. And our next Azor High character, who also carries a burning sword, gives us even more of the same foreshadowing of the hero of the Long Night as having hard, protective skin. Stannis Baratheon, Lord of Dragonstone and by the grace of God's rightful heir to the Iron Throne of the Seven Kings of Westeros, was broad of shoulder and sinewy of limb, with a tightness to his face and flesh that spoke of leather cured in the sun until it was as tough as steel. Hard was the word men used when they spoke of Stannis, and hard he was. This quote from Crescent's prologue in A Clash of Kings directly calls out this Azor Ahai parallel character Stannis as having hard skin, being described as tough as steel, which is the exact characteristic I'm suggesting our Long Night heroes obtained to defeat the others. It also refers to him as a hard man, which not only implies his unyielding nature, but cleverly suggests his hard skin, making him a hard man, just like our Stone Kings of Winter are described as hard men for a hard time too. In fact, the name Stannis likely derives from the word Stanic or Stanos, meaning containing tin, which adds nicely to the idea of Stannis being a hard man. But the best example we find is while Melisandre is burning Rattleshirt and the potentially false Horn of Winter, to which Jon thinks in descriptive terms while looking at Stannis and Melisandre that he is stone and she is flame. And Davos actually repeats this language in A Clash of Kings, describing Stannis's jaw as being hard as stone yet again. And while he isn't dead and resurrected, he is said to be half a corpse, implying him as undead, just like Bloodraven is said to be half corpse and half tree, and Beric is the lord of corpses as well. And as one of our main Azor High parallel characters, we should not only see him as symbolically made of stone, but we should also see his knights and warriors that he leads as being symbolically made of stone as well. And we do. As it just so happens, the army that Stannis is set to inherit after Renly's death is described by Catelyn in a rather interesting way. The long ranks of man and horse were armoured in darkness, as black as if the smith had hammered night itself into steel. There were banners to her right, banners to her left, and rank on rank of banners before her, but in the pre-dawn gloom neither colours nor sigils could be discerned. A grey army, Catelyn thought, grey men on grey horses beneath grey banners. As they sat their horses waiting, Renly's shadow knights pointed their lances upward, so she rode through a forest of tall, naked trees, bereft of leaves and life. As you've just heard, Catelyn implies that this army has magical armour made by the gods. She then goes on to describe them as a grey army, grey men on grey horses beneath grey banners, not only implying them as undead, but potentially as being stone as well. And to top it off, they are then implied as tree people, with their lances pointing upward, being described as a forest of tall, naked trees. And if that wasn't enough evidence for Azor Ahai commanding stone warriors under trees, another army we find Stannis commanding are the northern clansmen, who just so happen to dress as trees in the Wayward Bride chapter from A Dance with Dragons. Then she realised that the trees were creeping closer. Oh, she laughed. These mountain goats have cloaked themselves in pine boughs. The woods were on the move, creeping towards the castle like a slow green tide. She thought back to a tale she heard as a child about the children of the forest and their battles with the first men when the green seers turned the trees to warriors. Which is amazing, as just while we're hearing of an army of tree people being led by Stannis, an Azor Ahai character, we also hear of a tale of the children of the forest turning trees into soldiers, just like we think the children did for our last hero, Azor Ahai. But the most interesting detail about this tree army is that the northern soldier dressed as a tree that Asher interrogates is from House Flint, giving these tree warriors of Azor Ahai stone symbolism yet again. Now, just as a quick aside to show you just how deep the symbolism and foreshadowing that Azor Ahai's army was made of stone goes, 
let's take a look at another Azor High character you wouldn't expect me to bring up when speaking of the stone Starks beneath Winterfell. Daenerys Targaryen. Now I'll be honest, I was surprised how deep the references to Danny having a stone army to lead really went. I researched her chapters just for interest's sake, as she is one of the two main candidates for the title of Azor High Reborn, and therefore warranted investigating. And what I found during this reread really shows just how deep the connection between Azor High leading an army of stone warriors really goes. In A Storm of Swords, Daenerys needs to acquire an army to have some strength on her side so she can liberate the slaves of the East and eventually take back the Iron Throne. So she decides to acquire the Unsullied. And amazingly, these eunuch warriors of our new Azor Ahai are shown as stone warriors as well. While Danny is inspecting the Unsullied before liberating them, she notes that they could be made of brick themselves and that their stony eyes fixed straight ahead, implying them as stone warriors and sounding exactly like the stone kings of winter and their fixed stony eyes. We also see them described as being cast of bronze, implying that they're statues yet again, with bronze also being associated as a metal of winter, dark and strong to fight against the cold. And we even see the Unsullied directly referred to as statues by Danny when it says, against the pillars, her Unsullied stood like statues in their spiked caps, their smooth faces expressionless. The Unsullied are even compared to the Night's Watch directly by George, both being brotherhoods, one of which takes a vow of celibacy and the other has celibacy forced upon them in the interest of both groups maintaining their duty. Amazingly, we also see George give us the one-eyed symbolism we've seen in Bloodraven, Beric and John after Krasnys cuts off one of the unsullied soldier's nipples in a show of discipline, leaving behind a round bloody eye as if one eye has been removed. But the most amazing evidence to support our theory, one of the most intriguing quotes, is this exchange between Danny and Krasnys describing the process of creating the unsullied. Do you know how unsullied are made and trained? Cruelly, I have no doubt. When a smith makes a sword, he thrusts the blade into the fire, beats on it with a hammer, and then plunges it into iced water to temper the steel. If you would savour the sweet taste of the fruit, you must water the tree. This tree has been watered with blood. How else to grow a soldier? Here, we see George showing us not only his amazing writing skills, but also the creation of a sword, potentially referencing Lightbringer, our most famous forging story, and comparing it to the creation of these unsullied soldiers, symbolising these stone warriors as a version of Lightbringer as well, just as we think the stone kings are a key weapon against the others too. These stone soldiers are then referred to as the fruit of a tree, and stone soldiers who are a gift from the tree is exactly what our stone kings would be, the fruit of the weirwood produced to save humanity. But what does it take to create these soldiers from the tree? Blood, reminding us of the sacrifices the first men made to their weirwoods and the process I'm suggesting the first Night's Watch went through, spilling their own blood in a ritual sacrifice to become undead stone soldiers resurrected from the weirwoods. And finally, in A Dance with Dragons, we see a reference to this stone army she's leading as having been raised up out of a dream, giving us an Azor Ahai parallel character raising an army of stone warriors out of sleep yet again. All in all, I think it's pretty clear that George is showing us through Danny that Azor Ahai is foreshadowed to lead an army of stone warriors, just as we've seen with Stannis in his grey and flint armies and Beric and his preserved knights of the Hollow Hill. And the next character we're going to look at is our Song of Ice and Fire himself. Jon Snow, our next Azor Ahai and our next King of Winter. A resurrected skin-changing Stark Night's Watch Lord Commander with one eye symbolism after Aurel's eagle attack, whose house has a broken sword, dreams of wielding a magical weapon and amazingly wearing magical armour as well. 
And it just so happens that George has placed a disease for Shadow to reawaken that turns people to stone, right where John is set to be resurrected. As we hear from Val, in regards to Shireen's grayscale, that the grey death sleeps only to wake again. Potentially hinting at this disease that turns people to stone, reawakening to infect once more. It also happens that Shireen, the source of the grayscale, would be thought by Melisandre to have king's blood. And knowing that Shireen is destined to be burnt alive as a sacrifice, perhaps this burning will be Melisandre's attempt to use the power of king's blood in Shireen to resurrect John, the next Azor High. And if this burning reawakens her grayscale and spreads to John as he is resurrected, this would be the fulfilling of the prophecy of using king's blood to wake the stone dragon with John becoming a resurrected stone Targaryen. In fact, to further this, we find out in A Clash of Kings that Shireen has dreams of being eaten by stone dragons, which would make sense if this was the case, as John would be the stone dragon consuming Shireen's life that she has feared all along. It's even foreshadowed that John will contract grayscale through the story of John Connington, known as the Griffin Reborn, giving resurrection symbolism, who has a red wolf pelt showing us fire and ice like Jon Snow, who also keeps the Night's Watch while travelling down the River Rhoyne, and as we know, is slowly turning to stone. We also see this foreshadowed during Bran's Fly or Die dream, in which Bran turns his head north to the wall and notes that he sees Jon's skin growing cold and hard, not only foreshadowing him as dying, but also turning to stone from the grayscale as his skin becomes hard as well. To further this, after Jon Snow takes up the position of Lord Commander and has to swap Dalla and Gilly's child to protect them from possible sacrifice, Sam wonders to himself and asks Maester Aemon when Jon's heart had turned to stone, to which Aemon replies, when you raised him up to be Lord Commander implying that John was symbolically turned to stone when he took his position of Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. We even have a rather X-rated reference to John being made of stone as well, which I won't mention here, but if you know the quote I'm referencing, drop it in the comments below. As a hint, he happens to be underground, like the Stone Kings, while this is taking place. And amazingly, during John's Azor High dream, he finds himself sporting magical armour which I think is symbolic of his protective stone skin, gifted to him through death and resurrection, while also being surrounded by anthropomorphized figures of Night's Watch brothers, reminding us of the anthropomorphized stone brothers of the first Night's Watch in the crypts. He then goes on to declare himself the Lord of Winterfell, letting everyone know that Azor Ahai bears a flaming sword, wears magical armor, is the King of Winter, and fights alongside inanimate physical representations of human beings, comparable to our statues foreshadowed to rise. But by far the strongest suggestion of John becoming a Stone King of Winter is in his reoccurring dreams. Now it's very interesting that our soon-to-be resurrected Stark King of Winter has a reoccurring dream of ending up alone in the crypts. As I don't think this is just a nightmare, I think these dreams might be prophetic. As John is going into the crypts in his dreams, he senses the kings of winter down there, but notes that he isn't scared of them. He's scared of something else, and the terror seems to grow in him the deeper he gets. It seems what he is scared of is having to go down there. Not because of who's down there, but why he has to go down there. He mentions that he feels as though he has to go down, even though he doesn't want to, as if this is not a choice, but an oath he has to fulfill, perhaps to become a stone watcher from the walls after contracting grayscale, both alive and dead at his post, a new king of winter, doomed to spend thousands of years in a state of limbo, our new Azor high beneath Winterfell, awaiting the next long night. This reality of undeath John can sense is also being symbolically represented by the darkness he's walking into as the reality of becoming a Stone King of Winter is so dark, isolating and terrifying, he wants to scream. 
It's even foreshadowed that John will wake alongside the Stone Kings in this quote from A Game of Thrones. Last night he had dreamt the Winterfell dream again. He was wandering the empty castle, searching for his father, descending into the crypts. Only this time, the dream had gone further than before. In the dark, he'd heard the scrape of stone on stone, and when he turned, he saw that the vaults were opening, one after the other, as the dead kings came stumbling from their cold black graves. John had woken in pitch dark, his heart hammering. Notice that both John and the kings are waking in pitch dark, as if he and the stone kings are waking in the same place at the same time. Also note that George interestingly uses the term hammering after both John and the Kings of Winter are shown as waking. To further this, we even see an example of John literally rising from the crypts, just as we hear the Stone Kings doing, while Arya recalls a memory she had with her siblings in A Game of Thrones. So as you can see, it's very possible that John could be turned to stone after contracting Grayscale to become a resurrected stone hero of the Night's Watch and the saviour of humanity itself, only to then return to the crypts, just like in his dreams, to spend eternity waiting for the onset of the next long night. Now this next character I'd like to discuss is very interesting and in my eyes all but confirmed this theory for me. He's a Night's Watch Ranger from an ancient First Man house who parallels Jon Snow and furthers the idea of being invulnerable to damage through magical armour. And we actually see this Night's Watch Ranger battling the others. And his name is Waymar Royce, a brother of the Night's Watch from an ancient house of the First Men on a mission north of the Wall who we see resurrected and is described almost exactly like John, our next Long Night Hero. In the Game of Thrones prologue, Waymar is described as a handsome youth of 18, grey-eyed and graceful, and slender as a knife. And in the very next chapter, John, another brother of the Night's Watch from an ancient house of the First Men, is also described as having grey eyes and being slender as well, telling me that George is using Waymar to cleverly foreshadow John's story. Interestingly, Waymar's cloak, which is heavily focused on by George, is described as his crowning glory, showing king symbolism around Waymar as well, just as John is our next king of winter. This chapter is also filled with references to anthropomorphized trees yet again, as we see more use of the grey-green sentinels by George, with a great sentinel seemingly at the heart of the action. And these trees are even symbolically brought to life as we hear that a cold wind was blowing out of the north and it made the trees rustle like living things, giving us trees coming to life in response to the cold winds out of the north, just as we suspect the spirits within the weirwoods to come to life in response to the others returning from the north. And amazingly, after Waymar's battle with the others, his sword is broken just like that of the last hero, Azura High, and the Stone Kings of Winter. And amazingly, this broken sword is described as looking like a tree struck by lightning. And when Waymar is resurrected after his battle with the others, his face is described by George as a ruin, not only meaning that his face was damaged beyond repair, including one missing eye yet again, but also think ruins, ancient castles or structures generally made of stone that stand the test of time, symbolically painting him as stone as well. Now you might think this is a flimsy connection to this Long Night parallel character being made of stone, but after a closer look at House Royce itself, we may have actually confirmed our whole theory. Interestingly, the words of House Royce are we remember, suggesting to me that this house remembers something very important. And being an ancient first man house, this information could potentially be the key to ending the long night. And one thing the Royces have practiced from ancient times that sets them apart from other first man houses is their magical runic armor, an armor with ancient first men runes to protect the wearer from harm. 
And to suggest that this magical armour that House Royce remembers could have been real, we actually have other examples of markings being worn on the skin to ward the user from harm. Like that of Steel Skin, the pit fighter in Marine, who supposedly has skin as hard as steel, which is very reminiscent of Stannis, our supposed Azura High, who is described as having skin as hard as steel, Blood Raven, whose skin is described as hard as well, and the Kings of Winter, who were hard men for a hard time. So what I'm suggesting here is that this ancient northern house remembers a runic magic that worked in conjunction with Grayscale to turn the body to stone, making the skin hard to protect the individual from harm. The same magic I'm suggesting the last hero learned from the children to turn the tides of men. And if this is true of House Royce, this would give us the Lords of Runestone using runes to turn their lords to stone, with their current ancestral bronze armour being a far less magical recreation of what happened during the first long night. And it's this magical protective stone armour that House Royce remembers and underwhelmingly recreates in modern times. I'll also quickly point out that runes are strongly linked to our stone kings beneath Winterfell as well, as we see them on the crown of the kings of winter and interestingly, on the burnt horn of winter as well. So if the last hero and the first men of the Night's Watch did employ magical runic stone armour to win the first battle for the dawn, we might see the others recall this and be cautious of this tactic during their first encounter with a brother of the Night's Watch. And it just so happens George chose this Night's Watch brother to be a descendant of House Royce. The first thing to note after a careful reread of this encounter between Sir Waymar and the others is that even though there is a group of others present, the first other challenges Waymar alone, before the remaining group approach, standing back at a distance, not interfering, almost observing their opponent. Almost as if they are worried this Night's Watch brother might be a difficult opponent to best. And by paying close attention to this scene, this group of others seems very focused on two things. Waymar's sword and whether or not he can be injured. Let's read through and see. Sir Waymar met him bravely. Dance with me then. He lifted his sword high over his head, defiant. His hands trembled from the weight of it, or perhaps from the cold. Yet in that moment, Will thought he was a boy no longer, but a man of the Night's Watch. The other halted. Will saw its eyes, blue, deeper and bluer than any human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. They fixed on the longsword, trembling on high. So Will, who was up a tree at this stage, notices that the other's eyes were fixed on the sword that Waymar is holding above his head. Which is interesting, because if the last Long Night hero defeated the others, wielding a magical burning sword, as Azora High is said to have done, Perhaps this is what the other is looking for, waiting for this Night's Watch brother's sword to potentially catch fire. As we read on, it's at this point, after it's noted he has an ordinary sword, that the group of others approach to observe their opponent. They emerged silently from the shadows, twins to the first. Three of them, four, five. Sir Waymar may have felt the cold that came with them, but he never saw them, never heard them. Will had to call out, it was his duty and his death if he did. He shivered and hugged the tree and kept the silence. Also note that it's only Will that can see them, meaning these others are watching this encounter from a safe enough distance that they can't be seen by Waymar. And I think the reason is not to endanger themselves in case this Night's Watch Ranger reveals himself as a Zora High Reborn, known to the others to have a burning sword. It's at this point that the fight ensues one on one. So Waymar met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Royce checked a second blow and a third, then fell back a step. Another flurry of blows and he fell back again. Behind him, to the right, to the left, all around him, the watchers stood patient, faceless, silent their shifting patterns of their delicate armour, making them all but invisible in the wood, yet they made no move to interfere. 
Note again, these others are still observing from a safe distance, even though his sword has proven not to be a fiery sword, telling me they are still hesitant for some reason and want to observe their opponent for a longer time. And as Waymar tires from the fight, we get this scene. Then Royce's parry came a beat too late. The pale sword bit through the ringmail beneath his arm. The young lord cried out in pain. Blood welled between the rings. It steamed in the cold and the droplets seemed red as fire where they touched the snow. Sir Waymar's fingers brushed his side. His moleskin glove came away soaked with red. The other said something in a language that Will did not know. His voice was like the cracking of ice on a winter lake and the words were mocking. Interestingly, immediately after noticing that his opponent has taken a wound, this other says something to his companions, mocking Waymar as if he is no true threat. As if to say, not only does he not have a flaming sword, but he can also be hurt. He bleeds. He is not invulnerable to our attacks. To which Waymar tries to pull one last act of desperate courage in this scene. Sir Waymar Royce found his fury. For Robert, he shouted, and he came up snarling, lifting the frost-covered longsword with both hands and swinging it around in a flat sidearm slash with all his weight behind it. The other's parry was almost lazy. When the blades touched, the steel shattered. A scream echoed through the forest night and the longsword shivered into a hundred brittle pieces, the shards scattering like a rain of needles. Royce went to his knees, shrieking and covered his eyes. Blood welled between his fingers. The watchers moved forward together, as if some signal had been given. Swords rose and fell, all in a deathly silence. It was cold butchery. The pale blades sliced through ring mail as if it were silk. Will closed his eyes. Far beneath him, he heard their voices and laughter sharp as icicles. Interestingly, it's only after Waymar is severely injured and falls to his knees screaming, incapacitated, do the spectating others move in as if some signal had been given, telling me the others very much feared this Night's Watch brother's capabilities. They all proceed to kill Waymar while laughing about the situation, almost as if to mock how easy it was to kill this Night's Watch brother. This sequence of events the hesitance to engage Waymar, the eyes of the others fixating on Waymar's sword and the mocking tone the others engage in after noticing Waymar can be injured tell me that the others were expecting an opponent who could match them, an opponent who was wielding a burning sword and could potentially be warded from harm. And not coincidentally, sporting magical armour from an ancient first man house that makes the wearer invulnerable to damage is exactly what Waymar Royce's ancestors are known for, and in my opinion, was the key to winning the War for the Dawn. So after seeing so many Azor Ahai last hero parallel characters referred to as being made of stone, being statues, or having hard skin, I think we've almost confirmed our hypothesis. But before we go, there is one more example that all but confirms this theory in my eyes. Old Nan had told them stories of the Titan back in Winterfell. He was a giant as tall as a mountain, and whenever Bravos stood in danger, he would wake with fire in his eyes, his rocky limbs grinding and groaning as he waded out into the sea to smash the enemies. That's right, we have a literal stone giant who comes to life in defense of man if his home is threatened. And like all the other Azor Ahai last hero parallel characters and the Star Kings of Winter, he's holding a broken sword. To further this last hero connection, in Arya's sample chapter from The Winds of Winter, we find an example of this stone giant being referred to as the Last Titan, a name very reminiscent of the last hero. While also referring to the anthropomorphized cliffs of stone he stands on as his brothers, only drawing further connections to the last hero and the Night's Watch being made of stone. In addition to this, the Titan of Bravos also roars to herald the setting of the sun and the coming of dawn, only further connecting him with the idea of being a light bringer. 
And just like all the other Azora High Last Hero characters we've discussed, like Beric, Bloodraven, John, and Waymar, as Arya is approaching Bravos, she sees the two fires burning in the eyes of the Titan as one due to distance, symbolically giving the Titan one eye, like the rest of our Long Night's heroes, in a rather clever way, becoming two eyes as they get closer. We also see the use of soldier pines yet again, covering the slopes around the Titan, giving us more tree warriors around this stone giant. And interestingly, his feet are cleverly described as planted, furthering the connection of our stone heroes to the trees. It's also said by Lomas Longstrider that the Titan is one of the nine wonders of the world, giving us the repeating number nine symbology yet again, just as we've seen with the nine iron spikes on the crown of the Kings of Winter and the nine weirwoods in the weirwood grove where John swears his oath. Another beautiful addition by George to tie this stone giant to the Starks is calling the ship that Arya sees the Titan from while arriving in Bravos the Titan's Daughter, which cleverly implies Arya as a direct descendant of a stone giant, who is being used by George to symbolically parallel our stone kings of winter, Arya's real ancestors. And as a quick side note, we also see another Stark girl presented as a Titan's daughter as well, when Sansa becomes Elaine Stone, the supposed daughter of Littlefinger, whose family sigil is also that of the Titan of Bravos, making Sansa a daughter of the Titan too. And amazingly, we even hear Arya think that the Titan of Bravos could step right over the walls of Winterfell, painting the image of a stone giant rising from beneath Winterfell and stepping right over the walls as he wakes. All in all, I think the Titan of Bravos is our biggest example of foreshadowing that George is giving us of who the last hero Azor Ahai was. It's my thoughts that perhaps the Titan is inspired by an ancient figure that the people of Bravos remember as the hero of the Long Night, the last Titan, a resurrected stone giant who watches for the onset of night and awakens in defence of its people when threatened and rises again in defence of man. And in my opinion, the ancient heroes that inspired this gigantic mythical stone figure are still residing beneath Winterfell, behind the collapsed section in the lowest level, waiting for the horn that wakes the sleepers. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. In part four, we're going to be looking at the children of the forest, their gods, their magic, the Horn of Winter, and all the giants George is hiding beneath Westeros. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss its release. Once again, thank you so much for watching my videos and supporting my channel. I'm so glad I could give you all something to think about and enjoy. And as always, I'd love to discuss your thoughts, ideas, or additional evidence around this theory in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.